you are most welcome to this talk. It's Wednesday evening, the 23rd of June. So I've had a couple of days off and uh, things moved really quickly, actually. So some overall um, orientation to begin with. Then we'll look at the US and the UK. And we've got an interesting or stroke, rather curious story after that as time allows. Now, moving on to the, um, the world situation, first of all. Uh, now, this is from World Meter. Do click on it. It's full of useful information. It's an American group, but the data does seem to be uh, as accurate as is going at the moment. So cases officially diagnosed COVID-19 globally, 180 million. The real number, of course, is way higher. Now, they put the recovered at 164 million and the current prevalence, they put it about 11.35 million people with the virus now now of those and this is really quite interesting uh, they say that a mild condition is 11.2 uh, 11 million 274 and that's 99.3 percent of the cases are mild and serious or critical still a lot of people 81,763 but that's only 0.7 percent of the total current current prevalence now this is a much lower proportion than we had, say, in the UK first and second wave of serious cases. And presumably this is because there's so much vaccination around the world now that many of the most vulnerable are protected from severe disease, the, the older people, those with comorbidities. So the seriousness of this condition is down a lot on what it has been. Still a, still a problem, but... These ratios are much, much better. I mean, in the past, uh, this would have been about 94, 95 and 5 or 6 percent getting really quite ill. So it's a really a vast improvement and that's encouraging. Now, I'm going to keep an eye on this because I'm not exactly sure where this data is coming from, but um, they're pretty good on the rest of the data. So I don't see why it shouldn't be accurate. Deaths getting on for four million globally, unfortunately. Now, it's also useful to look at global trends, and we see here that the global cases are going down. There's a downward trend at the moment, that kind of shape of line. So that is encouraging, largely due to reduced cases in uh, India, for example. But we will be having a look at other places where cases are still pretty high. And deaths-wise... Um, again, globally, we see that the number of deaths per day is going down at the moment. So also encouraging to see now, but based on the fact that most cases now seem to be of a mild nature, 99.3% according to this data, I think we can expect the death rate to carry on going down. Although there's a question mark on what's going to happen to the number of cases as we'll be uh, discussing. So um, to now let's look let's look at a few more orientation slides actually first of all well yeah there you go Australia New Zealand Canada excellent United States going down flattish more on the states in a minute Ireland English speaking countries here going down United Kingdom well the less said the better but we have to say that the cases are going up really quite dramatically still uh, more detail on the UK in a minute. Now, I've left the UK in there comparing it to other European nations. Germany at the bottom, then Italy, then France, then Belgium, then Denmark, then Spain. And this is kind of the typical. So France is about the average number of cases there for Europe, actually. And of course, we're going up due to the Delta variant first identified in India. What is going to happen when the Delta variant starts spreading here? Um, of course, is, as of now, um, unknown. But it it's unimaginable that the Delta variant won't start spreading in Europe as well. Um, now, South America, not particularly good. Mexico, low, which is great. Then I've put the United States on there for context. Then Ecuador, Peru. I've left the UK on there. No, it's not in America, but for context. Uh, then Bolivia, Paraguay, Chile, Brazil, Argentina and Colombia. So uh, at the moment, um, most cases, uh, a lot of cases now in South America, and we know that health services are quite stretched in quite a few parts of um, South America, unfortunately. 
as well. Now, if we move on to the United States now, um, there we go. So this is daily cases in the States and, and the line is good. The trajectory is down, but this will be going up shortly, I believe. And I'm going to give you reasons for that now. But as of now, we are enjoying relatively low numbers of cases in the States. I mean, it hasn't been that low since what way back in way, way back in then, whenever that was um, uh, early April 2020. And likewise, deaths in the States, daily deaths in the States, still going down, but not gone away. So um, seven day moving average there, uh, 287 deaths, but certainly way better than we than we were, of course. So the trend is good, but and there are there are some buts for the United States. Um, anyway, check out that data there for yourself. Of course, it's all there. Uh, Rochelle Walensky, um, CDC director, of course, anticipates Delta variant will become dominant in the next uh, one to two months, and I think she's right because it seems to be doubling every two weeks. The Delta variant is doubling every two weeks, replacing the B117 Alpha UK variant. So, for example, on the 8th of May, the Delta variant was 1.2%. Now, as the 23rd of June, it's 20.6%. So, presumably, if this trend continues, and unfortunately, we've no reason to expect it won't, we would expect the Delta variant by the 7th of July to represent 40 percent of cases in the United States and 80 percent in 21st of July. So basically by uh, August, I'm expecting the Delta variant first identified in India to be the predominant strain in the United States. Um, now, the United States has got a lot to learn from the UK experience on this, but more on that in a minute. 300 million doses in the first 150 days of the Biden administration. Of course, they had initially hoped for 100 million in the first 100 days. That's been way exceeded. So that is good. But the total figure, in fact, we've got the vaccines at the top there. Uh, adults in the United States at the moment is 65.6% vaccinated and of course the administration wants um by the 4th of july 70 percent, and they're probably not going to get it so that is a pity it looks like that target is going to be missed unless something happens and to improve that kamala harris has been where did she go she went down south somewhere jill biden's also gone to the southern states to try and encourage the southern states to take up the vaccine in greater numbers because it's largely been the southern states that have been lower in numbers and there's a demographic factor in the states as well um 38.3 percent of 18 to 29 year olds with one dose of vaccine so again much much lower in the younger demographic who can contract this and spread it on and of course this is Partly why uh, the Delta variant is doubling in percentage every two weeks in the United States. Now, fewer than 50 percent of eligible populations received at one at least one dose of vaccine. So these are vulnerable areas, for example, Missouri, Arkansas, Nevada, Utah. Caseloads and hospitalizations are increase, increasing in some of the areas of these these states, for example. Now, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see the Delta variant breaking through in areas of the United States. That is what's going to happen because we know it's it's twice as transmissible as the original variant. Now, um, about 60 percent more infectious than the Alpha UK variant. Now, Missouri uh, monitoring in sewage. So they're finding the Delta variant in sewage. PCR testing of sewage. This was done quite extensively in the UK, monitoring wastewater to look at the prevalence and the spread of new variants. Now, what they're finding in Missouri, where the Delta variant first identified in India is taking hold, is um, infection of whole households. 
So what was happening before is uh, m m maybe one or two people in the household might get infected. They would isolate in part of the house uh, and, and then the rest of the household may not get it. Well, that's not happening now because of the increased transmissibility. Usually the whole household is getting it unless they are vaccine protected. So whole households are being protected. And the usual preventative measures, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, are not working as effectively because of the massively increased transmissibility of, the, of this variant. Now, this also explains quite a lot about how this variant got into the UK. Now, of course, on this channel, we advocated stopping flights from India. Obviously, it didn't happen. But quite a few people went to Pakistan and India for family occasions or whatever it was, came back, um, Asian peoples in uh, UK, not always, of course, but there's a higher preponderance of them living multi-generational households. One person will go into that household, isolate there, but spread it to others in the household who would then go to work, then go to school. And hey, presto, before you know it, 99% of cases in the UK are the Delta variant. We anticipated that, a pity it wasn't acted on. But looking back, the, the way that the spread has happened in Missouri with whole households explains the rapid spread in the UK. Of course, if we'd had an Australian system and people coming back from India and Pakistan had been isolated in hotels, then they wouldn't have been able to spread it to their families who were not required to isolate, who were going out mixing in the community, and we wouldn't have had this problem. It was obvious, and we did bounce up and down about it quite a bit on this channel and I know that thousands of you literally um, messaged in and emailed in to agree. And yet we are where we are. So unfortunate, but that does explain it. Albeit far too late to help us in the UK. But useful information for the United States. Whole households basically would now need to isolate if one person is confirmed to have the Delta variant. Otherwise they'll spread it to other members of the households and it will... Uh, spread round that explains the problem in the UK. So the the alpha variant was 40% 40, 40 more infectious than the original variant. Uh, the uh, delta variant 60% uh, more infectious than the original UK Kent alpha variant. So we're now 100% more infectious than the original variant, doubling the number of cases, which is why previous measures have not worked and household spread has occurred. And it seems with this Delta variant, you need a lower inoculum combined with a higher viral load. Now, the inoculum, I think you probably all know, is the amount of viral particles you need to establish an infection. That appears to be lower. And then it colonizes the respiratory mucosas more quickly, produces more virus. Therefore, the person is excreting a higher viral load, partly explaining the increased transmissibility. That, with changes to the spike protein, which probably means it adheres to the ACE2 receptor more effectively. So a bad triple combination of factors there, probably. Now, moving on to the UK, uh, let's just look at the UK here. Um, now, well, th there we have it. Uh, 16,135 new cases today, uh, up 43.9% on the week. Deaths up although the numbers still are thankfully low, but they are nonetheless up. And patients admitted also up. This is the effects of the Delta variant. Now, it's always good to put it in context. So if, if we look at the, um, if we do look at the graphs here, we can see it's, well, it's definitely going up. Now, this spike here, um, th th this great increase in cases, this uh, 16,000 new cases, in the day. This is largely due to surge testing in Scotland. More on why that's happening in a minute. But 4.6 million people officially diagnosed. But ju just carrying on looking at the, the graphics, uh, again, deaths in the UK, thankfully, are remarkably low. Now, they are up on the week, but they're up from a very, very low level. So that is encouraging as the vaccines break this link. And uh, the vaccination program continues to go well as government ministers have been uh, mouthing off about today. And, and with some justification, it has to be said. So that's uh, that's the UK figures. Search testing in Scotland. Uh, deaths 19 in the day, taking deaths up to 128,000. 
Uh, deaths certificated in the past seven days, another 93, making 152,000 and those certificated. Vaccines all over 18 are well uh, uh, eligible. It's now 200 days since the first vaccine given in the UK, so we're well into the programme. First dose, 82.5%. Second dose, 60.3%. And the Minister, Nadeem Sahar, was pointed out today, in case we couldn't work it out, that was three in five adults have now had two doses. But of course, not all of these are covered yet because we have to wait two to three weeks after the second dose. Interval for the over 40s is down to eight weeks. This is because you need two doses to get any significant protection against the Delta variant. This is why this change has been brought about. So Nadeem Sahar, we're standing in for the Prime Minister today on the... Um, on the Downing Street update. He's the vaccine deployment minister. It was interesting. Um, BBC One, BBC Two, the main channels in the UK, didn't cover it. You had to go onto the news channel to watch it. So I think there was some programme about antiques or something on rather than putting that on. But there you go. Um, now, Nadim Sahari said this, if 85% of all our adults are doubly vaccinated and the vaccines are 85% effective, then the protection level is 72%. Now, to tell you the truth, I don't know how he worked that out. In fact, I'm sure he didn't. I'm sure his statisticians worked it out. That's why I'm reporting it. So that will be accurate. Although, personally, I'm not quite sure um, how they get to that. But th 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 there you go. Probably percentages of percentages. But we can assume that Nadeem Sahari is well statistically informed. But that does leave 28% of the population at some risk. And, of course, we're nowhere near this yet nowhere near that level so i'm afraid this gives opportunity and this applies to the states as well for increasing cases with the winter weather again of course we're now partly protected by the better weather as we were last year so a resurgence in winter quite possible despite the vaccination but hopefully way less people getting seriously sick and hospitalized because of the vaccines um, almost half of the 25 to 20, 29 year olds in England have had the first dose so uh, young adults accepting the vaccine in, in England at least and indeed the UK as a whole much better than, the, than parts of the United States Nadeem Sahawi uh, says that the vaccines have saved 14,000 lives and 44,000 hospitalisations so far they rolled out this other doctor today Dr Nikki Kanini, medical director for primary care again very very enthusiastically plugging the vaccines, encouraging vaccines, as was Dr. Mary Ramsey, head of immunisation for Public Health England. We've only seen 41 cases of the Delta Plus variant. And I thought, what? The Delta Plus variant. Now, to tell you the truth, I might be a day or two out of date, but this is the first I'd heard of this, the Delta Plus variant. But anyway, um, Dr. Mary Ramsey thinks we're on top of it, which means I think she thinks she's controlling it with surge testing in Scotland. So if you're anything like me, you're saying, well, what the heck is it? What the heck is the Delta Plus variant? Don't know too much about it yet, but what we do know, or let me share the totality of my knowledge with you rather at the moment. This is a mutation called the K417N. In other words, on the spike protein in the 417th position of the amino acid, the K form has been changed to the N form. That is the mutation. And uh, this is a mutation which is associated with the beta variant, which, of course, was first identified in South Africa. Now, the reason that this is concerning is this K417N mutation in South Africa has been associated with immunological escape and possible reduced vaccine efficacy. More on that. We don't know. I don't know more than that yet. All I know is it's been associated with it in the South Africa uh, beta variant. So um, at least 41 people in the UK, so it's at least 41 people in the UK, Public Health England, are saying I've got this Delta Plus variant. So basically it's the Delta variant that we know and hate from uh, Indian origin, plus it's got this K417N mutation as well. In other words, it looks like this is going to have the increased transmissibility of the India variant, uh, sorry, the uh, Delta variant, whatever you want to call it, first identified in India, with the possibility of some immune escape as per the beta variant first identified in South Africa. So 
it's 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 a concern, but I still think we're going to be largely protected by the vaccine, so I'm not worried about it. But it's one certainly to keep an eye on. You know, I guess what evolution will do is keep optimising this virus as much as it can. The question is, how far has it got to go? How much more can it keep changing? And op how much more optimization can the virus do to make it more transmissible? So that the virus ensures that the greater number of vi greatest number of possible viral particles exist in the world, which, of course, is the aim of this virus. Whereas we want the opposite, of course. We want to eradicate the thing. Indian authorities say it's of concern and sweeping across India, particularly in Maharashtra, we believe. So this is the Delta Plus in India. First identified in Nepal, evolved from the Delta from India, also found in Wales and Scotland. So these 41 cases in the UK seem to be primarily Wales and uh, Scotland rather than England at the moment. But obviously quite a bit more to come on that, which we'll keep an eye on. Now, um, the curious story for today. Now, I've got to be, I don't want to tell you anything that's not evidence based here. So I've put all the references for this. So this was, what we're looking at here is the reference from the... Um, this was the thing here, the letter from the Lancet. We stand together to strongly condemn any conspiracy theory suggested that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. Now, this is from this uh, Lancet letter. We covered it at the time, of course. Um, but it's there. That's the Lancet letter. Statement in support, as you can see there, directly from the website. Statement in support of the scientists, public health professionals. Right, that's there. That's the link there. Click on it. Uh, the direct quote from that, we stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories. Um, conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. OK, now, members of the China team visit. Now, this is on this site here. So, again, um, because I don't want to go away from the evidence, that's on this site here. And we see that one of the members here is Dr. Peter Daszak, PhD. Now, I believe Dr. Daszak is of British birth, I think. I'm not sure about that. I think he is, actually. But anyway, he was on this... Uh, it was a 12-person team, wasn't it, that went to investigate the origins of the virus in China, and that's directly from the WHO site. And that's the uh, screenshot from that. So he, he was on that team. Now, next. This is from the Lancet. 21st of June. Amendment. Competing interests in the origin of SARS coronavirus 2. Starting to get curious now. So um, this is the write-up about that and uh, the response from uh, Dr. Daz, what's his name? Dr. Daz, da, da, Dazak. I really am sorry, sir. I'm not, I really must learn how to pronounce your name. Um, any, anyway, um, so anyway, th these are all di direct quotes from this paper in the uh, Lancet. All direct quotes in italics. So it's direct quotes. Now, in this letter, authors declared no competing interest. Now, that is the original letter. So the authors of the original letter, that is this letter here. Let me just put that up on the screen. That letter there, uh, the authors can, uh, declared no uh, competing interests. So far, so good. Um but some readers to The Lancet have questioned the validity of this disclosure. Validity means the extent to something, the extent to which something does what it says it does. That's what validity means to me. Uh, the readers of The Lancet, particularly as it relates to one of the authors, Peter Daszak. Oh, so The Lancet readers seem to be uncomfortable. The Lancet invited the 27 authors of the letter to re-evaluate, re-evaluate, re-evaluate their competing interests. 
So they were invited to re-evaluate their competing interests. And uh, Peter Daszak has expanded on his disclosure. So he's expanded on it now, uh, on his disclosure statement for three pieces related to COVID-19 that he co-authored or contributed to in The Lancet. So this is The Lancet trying to... Giving, giving authors of these papers about COVID-19 and the three papers that Peter Daszak was involved in, uh, giving them chance to reevaluate, reevaluate their uh, their response. And he has done so here. Um, I did find it a little difficult to follow. You, you're welcome to to read it. The full statement is there. Now, I'm not going to try and uh, interpret any more of what this article says, but we will go on to the next thing that we want to look at. And this is. Yep, this, this is this. So this is from the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. That's the link there. Check it. Don't take my word for this. Now, um, it seems that uh, Pete has been recorded accused from commission work on the origins of the pandemic so here we have the uh direct feed again all oh, this is all straight off the internet i'm only saying what i can say is it from the evidence i'm giving so this is the lancet covid19 commission these are the commissioners and here they are the lancet commissioners and this is uh dr peter daszak president Eco Health Alliance. Uh, anyway, it says here, this is me just reading directly from the site, recu recused from commission work on the origin of the pandemic. So he's been recused. Now, the legal beagles among you will know exactly what recused means. I didn't have a clue. I'm sure, I'm sure most of you watching didn't have a clue. So in the old days, when you didn't have a clue, you'd go and get a dictionary and have a look. These days, of course, you go to Google. And I went to Google. I'm not saying this is connected to what we've just looked at in any way, shape or form. But Google says recused. This is the definition. Uh, challenge. And this seems to be, for example, a judge, prosecutor or juror. As unqualified to perform legal duties because of potential conflict of interest or lack of impartiality. Uh, in brackets of a judge excuses oneself from a case because of a potential conflict of interest or lack of impartiality and I'll put a few press links to this story on, on the bottom there so there you go um, so um, it looks like as a result of the Lancet inviting people to um, what was the term Inviting people to reevaluate uh, that they're, they're asking people to reevaluate their competing interests, and whether that's related to this uh, recusal or not, of course, I have no way of telling. You may know more about that than I do. Interesting story. You know, what gets me really, the thing that really gets me about this is where is the investigative journalism in this pandemic? You know, I would have thought that the, the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 SARS COVID-19 pandemic was one of the biggest stories of, of, of the last 18 months. And yet, where is the investigative journalism? You know, if tricky dicky, I mean, President Nixon had, 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 had President Nixon had, had been uh, in the White House, and uh, there was Watergate. Um, would would he be found out now? Because the investigative journalism just doesn't seem to be there. Um, it really does seem strange that some of these things just don't seem to be getting investigated. Anyway, so so that was on that recusal. And hopefully now we now add another word to our vocabulary. Um, now, um, last thing I want to do today. That, 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 that's today's video's finished. Thank you very much for, for watching. I hope that was interesting. And now this is purely personal. But um, 
you know, one thing that really gets on my... Well, there's a lot of things get on, lots of things get on my nerves, as, as you're well aware. But one of the things that really gets on my nerves is when people... You watch a YouTube video and people says, Oh, before we go any further, like, subscribe, click the bell icon, all this. I just find it quite demeaning, really, that people do that. But um, I've never, ever done that. Yet, despite that, uh, this popped up on my computer screen uh, yesterday, or was it the day before? So there you go, uh, a million and one subscribers. So um, really quite uh, quite incredible, and it, it is it is genuinely um, it is genuinely moving and humble that so many people have, have subscribed. So um, uh, thank you for that, and uh, it's just great to know that um, I'm not sitting here in my back room talking to myself but you are listening so again thank you for listening and thank you for watching this talk